yes, I am really pleased that I uh, am able to share some of the work I've been doing on social isolation and loneliness. And let me introduce, first of all, my colleague here, Nancy Newall. She's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Brandon University. So the two of us have been working on this topic for, for quite a few years now, uh, probably well over 10 years in some form or the other. And uh, we'll keep going with it. Um, starting off with some definitions. Uh, just so we're all on the same page, what do I mean by social isolation and loneliness? Imagine we have two people, and I call them here Lizzie and Tom, and the circles around those two people reflect their social networks. So the squares within the circles are the people in the social network. The people within the small circle are the people that are really the person feels sees a lot, is close to the outer circle, are also important people in the person's life. And the different colors reflect different people. For example, red is for the partner or spouse, and the blue is for children, grandchildren. And so we, we, we carry these networks through life with us. Um, now, when you look at the two networks, they're very, very different. So Lizzie has a lot of people in her social network. Uh, Tom has very few, so probably we could uh, argue, uh, you might agree with me that Lizzie might not be socially isolated because she does have a lot of people around her that she, let's say we've asked her, that she sees a lot, she has a lot of contact with, um, versus Tom does not. So social isolation then is an objective state of a lack of social contact. It's something we can count. We can count the number of people in the network. We can ask about frequency of contact and we can say that Lizzie, let's say, is not socially isolated whereas Tom is. Loneliness on the other hand is a feeling. It is an unpleasant feeling of being disconnected, of not having the enough contact, not the type of contact that one would like. So looking at Tom, not a lot of people in the social network, really we could say socially isolated. We don't know whether he's lonely. Maybe he's actually not lonely at, at all. Maybe he's just happy with having very few uh, people in the network. Lizzie on the other hand, even though she has a lot of people in her social network might actually be lonely. We would have to ask her. Uh, the saying, as the saying goes, we can be lonely in a crowd. Now, we know from a lot of research for many decades, over many decades, that social isolation and loneliness, both of them, are health risks. And here are just a few examples. They're um, associated with the decreased immune system, increased risk of heart disease and stroke, increased risk of dementia, uh, increased risk of depression. Loneliness in particular is very strongly related to depression and lower quality of life. We also know that uh, social isolation is related to mortality, so it increases the risk of mortality as much as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now that statistic, that uh, piece of information has been quite a bit in the media, uh, during the pandemic especially, even though we have known this for over 40 years since the early 80s, so it's not a new finding at all. So we know social isolation and loneliness are bad. We've known that for a very long time. The real challenge though is how do we connect people? What do we do about it? And that is where uh, our work, Nancy and my work has focused on. So how can we get that socially isolated, socially or lonely person socially engaged uh, and, and connected to the very many programs that are actually available out there the, uh, that, are, that, that could provide some social uh, contact. So, our project, which we're calling Targeting Isolation, has two main objectives. One is to provide evidence-based information about social isolation, loneliness, but also about other aspects of, of uh, aging, about older adults, and then train community connectors to identify and refer at-risk older adults to resources in the community. Now, what do I mean by community connectors? 
A community connector is a person in the community who as part of their everyday work is in contact with older adults who might be socially isolated or lonely. So think about a pharmacist. Pharmacists have a lot of contact with a lot of people and they might actually be an older person's only contact as they pick up medication. So that might be a person who could say, well, wait a minute, there seems to be something wrong here. This person maybe is chatting a little bit too much. What's going on? I'm not sure. And so that person then, that pharmacist, that community connector could say, Again, there's warning signs here. I'm not sure what to do. This is not really my job, right? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a pharmacist. I'm not a counselor. And then they would refer that person over to a community organization who could assess needs and then connect the person with the appropriate resources. Now we can't do this project alone. So we are partnering with community organizations uh, that is uh, forming uh, what we call the Aging Well Together Coalition. And let me just briefly introduce the organizations. Activating, active Aging in Manitoba is an organization that focuses on active living, healthy aging. Uh, the Manitoba Association of Senior Communities focuses also on social engagement. It's an umbrella organization that uh, helps uh, active living uh, centers and seniors groups uh, with their programming. Uh, we have the Transportation Option Network for seniors, TONS, uh, that focuses, as the name suggests, on transportation. Transportation is a really important piece of this whole puzzle because what if there are programs out there in the community, but the person can't get to them, then they're stuck. So we need to also work on transportation. And then we have a and support services for older adults. And they provide specialized support services for older people. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, they have a really interesting um, program called Senior Centers Without Walls. It is programming for socially isolated older adults over the phone. So all kinds of things uh, that people can uh, call in and, and have programming over the phone. Uh, they also have a befriending program, so, so a volunteer will, will go into a person's home to, to chat with them and just for some friendly visiting. And overall, we also uh, try to raise awareness of the issue of social engagement, the importance of social engagement, and as well as programs and so on. So that's us. Now, targeting isolation. So that's the work that Nancy and I do, um, is very much based on CLSA. So CLSA provides a foundation for our work. And why is CLSA so important for us? Well, first of all, it's Canadian data, and that's super important. Uh, but in some cases, given what we're interested in, some of the basic statistics that we're interested in, we can also have Manitoba-specific data. And for our partner that's, partners, that's really important because they know what's going on right here in Manitoba, and some of it we can even look at Winnipeg. You know, what's happening here? What does the picture of social isolation loneliness look like right here? Um, CLSA also has a lot of questions on it, and, and, and thanks so much for responding to all of the questions that we ask you. But there are questions around social networks, social support, social participation, all of those are really important for us and loneliness, of course. Uh, in terms of our work, those are really, really important. So let me give you just a flavor of, of some of the things that is important for our partners. So just to know how common are social isolation and loneliness in Manitoba. Um, by the way, these numbers will not be that different in other uh, localities in other provinces. But again, for our partners, it's particularly important to you know, have the Manitoba figures. So about 20% uh, uh, of Manitobans age 65 plus are socially isolated. About 25% say they are lonely. And this is pre-COVID. 
and about one in three, so about 30%, uh, something like that, want to participate in more social activities. That last uh, piece of information is, is important, again, for our partners, because it suggests that people actually do want to be more socially engaged. There's, a, there's an opportunity there uh, if we only could uh, get them hooked up. Now, we know life changed during COVID. We all know that we have gone through it. And uh, I think all of us have to some extent, did to some extent become socially isolated. Many of us became lonely and CLSA has been, as was pointed out by Tina, has been incredibly useful to show what just the magnitude of that impact was. And so when we look at Manitoba figures, uh, Again, pre-COVID, we have about 20% socially isolated people, and then it goes to about a third, 30% uh, plus during COVID. Now, in and of itself, that doesn't surprise us because we all know that it was a real challenge to live through COVID. What is interesting, though, is how this will change over time as we get new data in. So as, we, as you are willing to participate, again, in being interviewed, how do the numbers change? Are people recovering from COVID? And perhaps even more importantly, are there certain groups of people who do not go back to normal? And that we need to know about, and that the organizations that we're working with need to know about where are the gaps, where are the challenges. We've also done research on uh, risk factors. So, um, both our research and other people's research shows that uh, um, social isolation loneliness is more common among people living on low income, those with health problems, those experiencing life transition and uh, losing a spouse, a partner is a very major impact, for example. So in order to, to group the, these, these risk factors, we've come up with the acronym HELPS, so knowing the risk factors helps. And we've, came up, we've come up with that just as a way of helping those community connectors remember some of these risk factors. And so, so again, briefly, they are health problems. Environmental factors would include things like uh, having access to transportation, uh, living in a, in a safe neighborhood, um, life transitions, again, I mentioned uh, loss of a spouse, but there are other life transitions that are really important, uh, like becoming a caregiver can be very isolating. Uh, losing a driver's license can make a big difference. There are psychological risk factors, for example, lower self-esteem, and some people have certain negative ways about thinking about their relationships, even if they have relationships, and that can be detrimental. And then we have certain social groups like, uh, uh, for example, people on low income who are more likely to be socially isolated or lonely. Another thing we have been working on a great deal is to say, how can we, how can we tell our community connectors who they should refer to a community organization? So, Yes, risk factors are important to know about, but not everybody who has a risk factor will be socially isolated and lonely. So can we be more specific? And we have done, Nancy and I, quite a lot of research using CLSA on that, but also combined with other people's research, we have once again come up with a, an acronym, show somebody you cared. So let's say you see somebody that you think it has some of those risk factors. Maybe there's some, some warning signs, there's some signals, something is not right here. What is it that you should look out for? The C stands for connections. That relates to the loneliness. Does the person want more social contact? Are they lonely? You might not wanna directly ask them if they're lonely, but you could ask, would you like to be around more people? Activities, does the person lack meaningful activities? And the question here might be, what do you do for fun? Would you like to do other things other than what you're currently doing? Relationships, uh, get at social isolation. 
how much contact does the person have with friends, family? So uh, how often do you see your family or friends, might the family members might be a question here. Does the person have an emergency contact? So are there social supports there if they're needed? And dwelling is, uh, are they living alone? Are they living in a safe neighborhood? Now, I wanted to just address a question that uh, somebody uh, sent our way, uh, and that has to do with living alone. And the question was, is living alone different from being living with a spouse? And my answer would be, it depends. We have it here as one of the questions to explore, but in and of itself, living alone does not need to be a problem, depending on the social network that the person has around them. So a person can live alone, but be very strongly socially connected and have social supports, right? They have, might have people to check in every day on them. They might go out a lot. They, so there's a very strong social network where they, is a problem is when a person lives alone and has no good social network and social support system. So think about what would happen if the person falls. Would somebody notice? Or as we've seen uh, some in some recent um, uh, disasters, natural disasters like heat waves, there were all the people living alone and nobody knew nobody realized that they were in danger and some of people died. So living alone is not the only thing. Of course, it depends really on other factors, the social support and social network around them. So what we tell our community connectors then, if, if you see some of these signs, the person seems to be lacking the connections, if three or more questions are, are causing you concern, refer the person over to a community um, organization. So we have, uh, in targeting isolation then, we have prepared fact sheets. So everything I talked about is on our website. You can access it there. It has more information than I could go through. We have reports. Uh, we have resources, various resources. We also have videos. We, you can meet Tima, Targeting Isolation Manitoba, who will talk you through some of the things I've talked about, like risk factors, so on and so on. So on. Uh, just to note that because we're working in Manitoba, our some of the stats, uh, the facts are Manitoba specific. So just be aware of that if you're accessing the website from outside. Some of it is general, but some of it will be Manitoba specific. Now to train community connectors, we've also developed workshops. So Nancy and I have given workshops. We've given them for, for example, pharmacists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and so on. But we've also developed e-learning modules. Again, they're accessible if you're interested in looking at that. You can look at them. One is for healthcare professionals like pharmacists, and one is for community volunteers. And again, goes through what is social isolation, what are some of the risk factors, what are some of those uh, signs. And then there's the referral information. Now, the caveat with this is that it is Manitoba focused. We are telling community connectors in Manitoba to refer over to a &O support services for all their adults, the organization that we're partnering. Why a &O? Well, because they're a partner of ours, but also because they have the capacity to call back the person when they're refer getting a, refer a referral. So when they get a referral, they can call the person, they have the capacity to assess needs and they can then uh, uh, get the person in touch with whatever uh, resources the person actually needs. So if you're looking at it from outside, I would encourage it, uh, outside Manitoba, I would encourage you to think about which organization would you refer somebody to? Is there an organization in your community that might make a lot of sense? So that's it for me. Um, thank you so much for participating in CLSA. Our work would not be possible without you. And for any of the information I talked about or other information, go to targetingisolation.com or you can contact me directly.